The government has declassified some information about UFOs, now called UAPs. What I'm wondering is, what are they? And do they mean that aliens could be living on planet Earth? I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. My name is Eric Hoven. I'm the president of Creation Today. And for those of you that are Creation members out there, thank you. I love these conversations that we get to have week after week. This one is going to be interesting. It's, um, it's certainly a subject that part of me wants to dive into and another part of me goes, this is weird, man. Eric, stay away from it. So, uh, of course, I believe in the Bible, and there's a lot of people out there that would say, well, the fact that you believe the Bible is weird, stay away from it. So I'm already used to uh, the stigma that comes with talking about things that uh, other people would find rather interesting. I'm curious what makes you so interested in this subject. So if you find the chat feature, for those of you that are joining us live, you can find the chat feature. I uh, want to welcome, by the way, those of you joining us on Facebook or on YouTube as we start uh, having this discussion with you guys as well. Uh, if, if you want to tell me in the chat, in the comments, what makes you so fascinated about aliens and UFOs? Why is this something that's fascinating to you? Uh, my guest today is none other than Dr. Jason Lyle, who is an astrophysicist and uh, I believe enjoys studying this kind of stuff as well. I think it's kind of fascinating to him. Dr. Lyle, thanks for hanging out with me today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is, uh, this. are you geeked out by this kind of stuff and what this is? Or is this like a side topic to you that you're like, well, I just happen to be an astrophysicist, so I talk about it. Uh, more of the latter. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't get me wrong. I, I very much enjoy science fiction. I, I, I love science fiction. Um, and it, it, but when aliens and alien spacecraft come up, that's science fiction. When people start talking about UFOs, uh, it's it's more uh, it, it's more about what they don't know about the about the sky, and uh, that's something that I, I studied the night sky quite a bit. So, what are UFOs to a lot of people are IFOs to me. I understand what they are because I've studied this stuff, and so but, but the, the whole the conspiracy angle and things like that that the government's trying to hide aliens. No, I don't find that. <laughs> don't find that particularly interesting. I find it very unconvincing. And, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it and, and why I find it unconvincing and, and maybe some of the answers that some people are uh, asking as to what, what people are seeing out there, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm curious what you guys out there are going to think about this conversation. I got to tell you, I, I grew up watching Star Trek. I was never a Star Wars junkie. I was a Star Trek junkie. And um, I had a, an event happen this last year that I found really interesting and very convincing. Uh, it was late at night, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I say late at night, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. For those of you that go to bed early, that's late at night. And I'm with a friend named Dave and Dave and I look up in the sky and we see something that we cannot explain, Jason. I videotaped this phenomenon. I turned the camera back on, turned it around on Dave and I, and I explained what I had seen. And I said, I want you guys to know, we just saw something. We're not crazy. We're not high. We're not drunk. We're under our normal capabilities, whatever level you think that is. And we just saw these objects flying across the sky. And I was like, I just want to document it just in case. And about an hour later, uh, I was able to get online and I was like, I'm seeing lights across the sky. And I think, Kent, you got a video clip of it, right? You know what you know what I saw when I saw nine lights going across the sky? Do you already know what it is? I'm guessing it was the Starlink project. It was. Can, can you show that Starlink video? It was the Starlink project. Uh, Elon <laughs> Musk had been releasing satellites. He wants to get a total of 42 sat or excuse me, 42,000 satellites around planet Earth to provide internet everywhere. So I saw this phenomenon and I'm like, Dave, man, what is going on? We're being invaded. And you can see how easily something like this could come across as, okay, what in the world are we seeing? Recently, though, the Pentagon has released footage that was before classified. 
it had gotten leaked out earlier, but now they're saying, okay, officially, yes, this is something that was taken, uh, footage uh, from uh, pilots, things like that, and they're now declassifying it and saying, hey, we're making it available. Can you show that video? But uh, we're making this available. Uh, and it is it is a phenomenon, you know, that that I find very interesting. I find fascinating and I'm going, okay, I'm okay with letting things outside my 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 little box into the box for a little while to play around with it and see what it is and then either reject it or somehow make it fit but uh they they released a lot of footage and that's what i want to that's what i know and i want to come to some conclusions on this webinar okay i need conclusions on um can we categorize all ufos and are there aliens or extraterrestrial life on planet earth those i kind of want to come to some conclusions on those in this conversation. So So you guys watching, maybe you've already seen this, but Dr. Lyle, uh, they're, they're, they're doing tracking. They're saying there's these vehicles that are doing speeds that are in excess of what uh, we could be capable of doing in the atmosphere. They say these things are doing some um, uh, maneuvers that are inexplainable according to our contemporary right now uh, development and technology with, with aerospace. Um, Doc... How in the world do we do we take a Christian worldview or even a secular worldview and 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 deal with this? Well, part part of the the problem is I didn't see it. Uh, I mean, I've seen I've seen a video, a very poor quality video. I, I, I'm not I'm not criticizing anybody. They're flying an aircraft, uh, for heaven's sakes. That's impressive in and of itself. And to be able to film something, but you know, these things are always it's a grainy and out of focus. And you know, it'd be different if it looked like something from a Spielberg movie where you know it was clear and had you know lights all around it. Th then I'd be a little more impressed. But you know, they see this little smudge that, for all I know, is a smudge on the camera. I mean, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, I, I did look at some of the uh, the released reports or summaries of the least the released reports, and uh, in most cases. There's no radar image. It's just a visual detection of the pilots and or the camera that they're using. And I don't I don't doubt that they are they're seeing something they don't understand. But the problem is there are thousands of things in the sky that if you don't know what they are to you, they're a UFO. And that includes things that you might see even when you're flying. And uh, so and, and that is not even including problems with getting the image in because uh, cameras are not magic. They don't create a perfect replica of what they're seeing. There's a process that's involved and that process can create artifacts, uh, things that uh, appear on the image that are not real. And I'll, I'll give you one example of this in my own field of astronomy, in a lot of photographs, uh, and I, I love looking at these photographs of star fields are gorgeous, but a lot of times, especially on the older ones, but even newer ones as well, um, you'll see what's called a ghost image. If you have a very bright star, let's say it's in the upper right, you'll have a faint ghost image of that star in the lower left. It's, it's flipped upside down and backwards. And that has to do with the way that the light paths work out in, in, in a telescope. 
And so, uh, and, and I've, I've taken my own images where I've had ghost images like that. Now I know what they are. And so, in it, but if you're, if you're watching that in a telescope, by the way, and you move, the ghost image moves in the opposite direction. It's, it's strange. And if you uh, didn't know what you were looking at, you'd think, oh man, I'm seeing something move at thousands of miles per hour. No, you're seeing a reflected image of that star. So uh, I mean, things like that. So how, I don't, without knowing the internal mechanism of the camera they're using, uh, apparently they were able to see it too, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, that I, I I can't make a I can't make a judgment. It's kind of like if somebody asked me, you know, they said, you know, I I took a test last week and I and I got one of the questions, I got one of the answers wrong. I don't remember what the question was. Can, can you tell me what the answer was? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I can't. I don't even know what test you were taking, let alone you know. So so each of these situations has to be looked at independently. If I'm if I'm there with you and you point out something in the night sky, there's a very high probability I can tell you what it is, including the Starlink project. In fact, I was uh, staying with a friend of mine uh, a couple months ago, staying at his house, and we we had, uh, it was after a talk I'd done, we pulled in, and he looked up and saw the Starlink. Jason, what is that? And I saw oh, that's that's Elon Musk's uh, Starlink project, and it is spectacular. And your video was very good to that, by the way. I, I took out my phone and I I got a amateurish video as well. Uh, I've seen several of those passes. And if you don't know what that is, boy, it's startling because they're bright. Yes. They're very bright. And they're, you know, perfect unison traveling in a straight line, like a fleet of battleships ready to encircle the earth and take it. No, it's just Elon yes. Musk providing us with very high speed internet, which uh, is, is perfectly fine. So those ones are a little easier to, to explain. And, and sometimes secondhand, if somebody gives an accurate description, they say, well, I saw this string of very bright stars in a sequence. I can say, yep, that's the Starlink project. Or if they say, I saw this thing and it became very bright and then it faded out, I can say, yep, that's an iridium flare and so on. Um, but the further removed it gets and the less accurate the description, the harder it is for me to even make a guess. So somebody's, you know, somebody says, well, my friend saw something. Now he'd been drinking. And of course, immediately flags go up, you know, and he, and he saw this thing and it came up like that. And well, that, that's third hand. I, I, you know, it, it show me a video, then I can maybe make a guess. But uh, when it's when the video is grainy like it is in these situations, it's hard to pin down. It could be almost anything. It could be a balloon or things like that. And people think, well, they're what's but it's moving at incredible speed. You don't know that. You don't know that unless you know the distance to it. You don't know how fast it's moving because a fly that flies past you, little house fly. Oh, if, if you assumed that that was far away, you'd assume it was traveling at thousands of miles per hour. It's not. It's traveling, you know, one mile per hour. It just it's just real close to you. And so if you don't have any distance estimate, you have no idea how fast these things are going. They could even be stationary. It just depends on your, uh, your point of view as well. Okay, so statistically, matter of fact, Kim, in the PowerPoint, I think I got it in there. Um, statistically, the number of people that have seen uh, or claim to see some kind of unidentified flying object, uh, by the way, instead of unidentified flying object, UFO is where we get that. Uh, they actually re renamed this phenomenon really to try to get away from the stigma of these UFOs, and they named them UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenons. So if you hear the terminology UAP, that's actually what it's referring to. Um, and the as the government, they've been studying this for years, they actually put together though a task force to try to help study this. Uh, there's, a, there's a website, uh, MUFON, M-U-F-O-N, uh, there where they want to study uh, what are these UFOs and, you know, how do they benefit humanity? They, they have a report every month of how many people submit reports saying, I saw something. And they will readily admit that 95 to 99% of these can be explained. But I just want you guys to know, it's not a small number. In May of 2020, just in the United States, there were 572. The next month, April of 2021, they had 19 entities observed. Uh, there were nine different hoverings and landings, 26 landings, hoverings, takeoffs, reports, 34 entities observed. Uh, that's May of 2020 that, that they're going, okay, this is something that, um, that has some kind of credibility to it. In May of 2021, there were 751 reports of these. So this is not a small number of people claiming to see something. This is a large number of people. Um, and I think I, I, I agree with Mufon, what Dr. Lyle is saying, man, most of these can be explained. It's just my first thought there when I saw the Starlink was, 
I don't know what that is, but and here's what I said. I, I almost showed the video, but it's like two minutes and you don't want to see me talking on here um, and telling you that I'm not drunk. Um, I'm like, hey, they're, they look like they're about, they're, they're at the space station height and uh, they, they seem to be traveling like the space sta- uh, the, the International Space Station is what it looked like to me. So, yeah. So what do we do with, with all these people and how many, how many do you, how do you classify the UAPs as they now are? I like that new terminology. I, I hope it does get away from the stigma a little bit, because once you put it that way, you realize what we're talking about. We're talking about something in the sky that you don't know what it is. And once you, <laughs> once you put it that way, it's like, oh, you know, oh, there, there are things in the universe I don't understand. Oh, you know, who, who could have imagined? We're human beings and the universe is amazing. And there are all kinds of atmospheric phenomena and, and phenomena in space and in low earth orbit um, that if people don't know what they are to them. They're a UFO or a, or a UAP. Uh, but if, if I was standing there with them, I could, I could tell you, oh, I know what that is. That's a, you know, that's a moon dog or, or whatever. There's all kinds of phenomena like that. Uh, one of the most commonly reported UFOs is Venus. When Venus is low in the sky, if the atmospheric turbulence is high, it will dance around and it'll look colorful and people, oh, that's, it's moving, but it's, it can't be Venus, it's moving. No, it's, it's turbulence, it's atmospheric turbulence. We see that when you look down the road on a hot summer day, you can see how the road looks like it's vibrating a little bit. It isn't. Uh, it's just the, the atmosphere. Uh, when, when light passes through air and there's temperature changes in the air, the light path gets deflected a little bit. That's what makes stars twinkle. And the effect is very severe near the horizon. And so even things like Venus, which is very bright, people will mistake it for a UFO because they don't know what it is. So that's just one example. Okay, I got a clip from uh, an interview. Um, YouTube may end up just kicking this off because I, I grabbed this from there. So YouTube, if I get cut off here, sorry about that. I'll see you guys next week. Um, but this clip is of uh, the guy in charge of this task force that was put together. Can, can you go to that clip? Yeah. And here's him talking about the five different things, characteristics of these UAPs, the ones that, the ones that they don't think are misidentifications, the one that they go, okay, this has some kind of credibility. He says, here's the five things. I want you to listen to this clip and then talk, talk through this with me. Okay, go ahead, bud. I don't know if you'd call it an interest, but there seems to be a connection with water. And these things have a, uh, have a, a tendency to be seen in and around water, which, which kind of leads to one of the observables uh, that we've had. There's five distinct observables that set this technology, as I mentioned earlier, aside from everything we have in our inventory. The first is hypersonic velocity, the ability to change directions instantly. Um, And and when I say instantly, I mean human beings can withstand about 9G forces. uh, Some of our best aircraft can withstand about 16Gs. These things are doing three, four, 600 Gs uh, in mid-flight. Then there's hypersonic velocity. Uh, That is speeds that by definition are Mach 5 or above, very, very fast. We do have some technology. You mentioned Russian hypersonics and things like that. You know, there there are technologies that can go that fast. But then again, you don't expect a a hypersonic aircraft to do a 90 degree turn. Uh, To put that into context, our SR-71 Blackbird, when at 3,200 miles an hour, wants to take a right hand turn, it takes roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. You don't expect it to just kind of do this. Uh, and that's precisely what we're seeing. And then the ser- third observable is a bit like cloaking. We call it low observability. But the fourth observable is what, what we were talking about, and that's transmedium travel and water. The ability for, for an object to fly not only in our atmosphere, low and high altitudes, but also potentially in a vacuum environment like space and even underwater. Now, we do have vehicles that can do that. We have, a, for example, an, a, a seaplane. A seaplane is, is a plane that can fly and it can float on the water. But when you look at it, it's neither really a very good aircraft or a boat because it's a design compromise. And yet what we are seeing are objects that can operate in all these domains or all these environments seemingly without any type of performance compromise. And so why are we seeing these things around in and around water is something that we're really we're really kind of scratching our heads with because we've seen these things they've been recorded not only in our atmosphere but there is data to suggest that they have also been tracked by some of our our capabilities underwater as well and being able to perform in ways that frankly exceed anything that we know we on, on the planet right now. Okay, so I hear that and I go Now, granted I 
there are government experts on the evolution worldview that will get on camera and tell you, here's how we know the earth is millions of years old. And I completely disagree with what they're observing and the conclusions they're coming to completely. I go, those geologic layers were not laid down over millions of years. Anyway, we, so there are experts, government experts that are paid to study this stuff that I completely disagree with. Where do you put the guy in charge of, of, of UFOs or UAPs, Jason? How do you, how do you take this expert commenting on the declassification of UAP footage? Uh, where do you put that in your mind? With a, with a huge grain of salt, um, because a lot of the things he's saying raise red flags immediately. He says they're associated with water. Well, water has what's called a high specific heat, which means it retains heat very well. And for that reason, uh, if it, the, uh, the land that, that cools and, and warms during the day, water doesn't so much. It, it's, it maintains a stable temperature, which is why coastal areas tend to have a fairly pleasant uh, climate year round. Uh, it, but what that does is it means if you're looking over a body of water, it, there could be heat coming off of it, and that generates turbulence. And so the, the, the effect of, ampli of uh, twinkling can be amplified hugely over a body of water, especially if it's a localized one. And so that immediately thinks, oh, OK, all right, you're more likely to see this kind of stuff from, from perfectly stationary stars if you're over a body of water. So that's, that's an immediate red flag. There are certain places in... Um, I think it's in the Southwest, maybe Texas, Nevada, Arizona, where they, people have seen these lights that are dancing around and we don't know what they are. They're, they're headlights, they're cars. And it's, it, it only happens under certain circumstances. It only happens when you have a temperature inversion and uh, that causes light to refract more. Cause normally you can only see a certain distance due to the curvature of the earth, but under certain circumstances, the atmosphere can refract that light. And under the right conditions, you, you can get these things. Get, well, we know that's what's causing it because when there's no traffic on the road, you don't get the lights. So that's that's one example of that. The next red flag come, comes up when he says, we see them doing impossible things, you know, 900 Gs. We see them moving and then at thousands of miles per hour and changing directions. How do you know how fast it's going? That's what I want to know. Is it, well, it's moving. You see, we don't see speed. We see angle. We see a change in angle. And by assuming the distance to the object, you could then compute the speed. But how do you know the distance to the object? How do you know this isn't, as a facetious example, how do you know this isn't a, a firefly, a lightning bug that just, zip, you know, gets that one, then he goes up that way? If you assumed that was 100 miles away, it would look like it's going 900 Gs, but it's not. Uh, the other thing that, that I want to point out, too, is that if, if you're looking through glass, that makes a difference as well. And so you these pilots who are seeing things, or if you're inside a car and you're looking through a window, I would immediately discount any of your observations because once you're looking through glass, it is very easy to fool your eyes. I mean, I can put, I can put glass up here like that. And by turning it, oh, I've got this UFO flying right around my head, but I really don't. It's just a piece of glass, but, it, but your brain can't tell whether the light's been transmitted through the glass or reflected from the other side. So you're in a car and you see this Thing and it zips around like that, it's actually Venus reflecting from the other side. And when the car turns, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. And if you haven't studied that, you're inclined to think, well, you know, that's I'm I'm seeing reality. What you're seeing is processed. It's 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 through glass in some cases, it's processed through your eyes. They have their own mechanisms by which they reject and accept noise and so on. Uh, so, so when people say stuff like that, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's probably perfectly natural explanation. If I was there, I could probably tell you what it is, but Without any more details, I can't tell you what it is because I didn't see it. And in this case, he didn't even present any video footage. Um, it, it, but it, even then, if it was video footage, it's always grainy. And, you know, so that's kind of the that's kind of the bottom line is most of these things, I think, are very explainable. It's just most people haven't bothered to study the kind of things that occur in the atmosphere. I've seen all kinds of strange stuff in the atmosphere, but it's all explainable in terms of meteorology or or man-made. I've seen I've seen a satellite reentry, spectacular, because it's nice, slow, very bright and beautiful. But I know what that is, and uh, you know other other phenomena with clouds where they'll you know appear and then they'll look like they're on fire, kind of, and then fade. Parhelia, uh, sun dogs or moon dogs, things like that. So all kinds of stuff like that, and I think his descriptions would fit most of those phenomena actually. Wow. Okay. I got to throw something else at you now. All right. So back in 1921, a guy was doing an experiment with uh, capacitors and he discovered that if he had 
two capacitors, one with a weaker voltage, the other one with a higher voltage, it would create a force towards the weaker voltage. He is said to have done this and charged up actually metal plates and actually created this, uh, this ability. Now this, this is, this is over a hundred years. Well, this is right at a hundred years ago. This is discovered. Uh, and you can kind of trace the story of them learning about this up to the fifties, kind of classifying a bunch of stuff. Uh, they in 1928 though, um, uh, that's a photo from 28. They actually invited this guy, T.T. Brown, Thomas, uh, Thomas Townsend Brown, Townsend Brown to, I believe it was France to do an experiment. It is said that he did this experiment inside of a gymnasium where they watched back in the 1950s, they watched this metal disc float and be able to do unique things in a gymnasium. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's the uh, the uh, the brown Byfield effect, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The um, yeah, and it, it's it, it's true. If you, you you can do that, you know, it's it's an electromagnetic phenomenon whereby um, you have the uh, the capacitors with the two different the anode and cathode are different sizes, and so you um, it, it'll it'll what it does is it ionizes the air and then pushes on it, so it's pushing on the air, and so you get a reaction force. It's really neat. Uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. Brown apparently thought he had made some kind of anti gravity. It's not anti gravity. Right. It's um, it's perfectly explainable in terms of known physics. I would argue that anti gravity is not is not possible because of, well, assuming Einstein's right, anti gravity is not possible because gravity is determined entirely by mass. Well, the stress energy tensor, but you you can't un you can't undo that. It's different from the other fields. The other fields we can nullify gravity. You can't nullify it. Um, but it is an electromagnetic phenomenon. It'll generate a force. We can do that. It's um, similar in some respects to an ion engine, which we've, which we've done. We've built spacecraft that have that technology. However, the brown bifield effect does require a medium. It won't, work, it won't work in space. It needs something to push on. So it needs air or some other medium to push on. So it's not gonna work in space, but yeah. And it, it produces a force and it doesn't have any moving parts, which is neat. I, I like stuff like that, but it's perfectly explainable in terms of known physics. And uh, yes, human beings have been able to make, uh, at least on a small scale, flying saucers that levitate. And in one or two cases, they've made large ones that levitate. Uh, there was back in, I think it was 59, 59, they did, a, they created this uh, um, it, a flying saucer. The human beings created a flying saucer. It was a military project. And uh, it was, they thought it would be just great because then they could fly in and they could go low on the ground or whatever. It turned out it was uh, not very stable, especially once you get low to the ground at low speeds, it worked pretty well. You get it up very high, it doesn't work so well, it's aerodynamically unstable. Today, we can build aircraft that are aerodynamically unstable and get them to fly anyway using computers. But back in 59, they couldn't do that. So it kind of fell out of favor. But I've, I've seen pictures of this thing. It's a flying saucer that human beings have made. We, we've had this technology for almost a century, as you pointed out. We've had this technology for a long time to be able to make and levitate flying saucers. And we, we have the technology to produce motion without moving parts using electromagnetism. So this is all known technology. You can buy drones that are saucer shaped and fly them. So it's not surprising that people have seen that because yeah, you can, you can get them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Hey, to our Facebook and our YouTube uh, channel, I just want to say thank you guys for hanging out with me. We got to cut you off right now. Uh, for those of you here on creation today, uh, dot org, uh, following us with our with our membership. We're going to keep on going with Dr. Lyle because Dr. Lyle, I want you to categorize these UAPs and I want to answer this question. Could it be the spiritual world? All right. So uh, those of you on Facebook and YouTube, thanks for joining us. Look forward to, to going back and reading some of your chats. Hopefully you guys got some good, nice things to say. Oh, the joy of the internet. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to you guys on that, but we're going to kick you guys off for now. So we'll see y'all later. Uh, Creation Today members, let's keep going here. Dr. Lyle, if you've ever wanted to have consistent growth into interesting conversations that help you understand the foundation of the Word of God and share that foundation with a lost world that desperately needs it, let me invite you to become a Creation Today 
member. My name is Eric Hovind. I'm the president of Creation Today. We have conversations each week with special guests on a variety of topics that are both intriguing and help us to dig down deeper into God's Word. So if you've ever wanted to truly grow in your faith, let me encourage you to spend a year with me. We'll get 52 sessions together and you'll get to be a Creation Today member that gets access not only to every live event we do and have an opportunity to have discussions with the guests, but also everything we've done in the past. It's a great way for you and your family to grow your faith. Thank you.